Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome. My name is Julie Fry. I'm president and CEO of California Humanities. And we are delighted to welcome, welcome you to our third California on the Ballot virtual event, part of our series of events that are taking place through April, focusing on topics related to electoral engagement in the state. The series was funded by the Why It Matters Civic and Electoral Participation Initiative, administered by the Federation of State Humanities Councils and funded by the Andrew W. Mellon Foundation. We are very grateful to be part of this national effort. For those of you not familiar with California Humanities, we're a statewide nonprofit. We're an independent partner of the National Endowment for the Humanities. And we make grants throughout the state and deliver programs that help us learn more about each other, our histories, our cultures, what we have in common, what makes us different, and to bring together to, to, to bring people together to discuss ideas and our past, present, and future. So to set up today's session and ground the electoral theme, we're going to start with a three-minute clip from Unladylike a short documentary about the life of Charlotta Spears Bass, the first African-American woman to run for vice president. This short is narrated by our moderator, Susan D. Anderson, and funded through our California Documentary Project. And now to the video. Bass ran for Congress in 1950 on the Progressive Party ticket. She lost, but didn't stop there. In 1952, she actually ran for the office of the Vice Presidency of the United States with Vincent Hallinan on the Progressive Party ticket. There wasn't a chance in hell that they were going to win, much less get a lot of votes. But she took every opportunity she could to have her voice heard and to bring the kind of social justice that she thought was needed. It is with great pride that I come before the American people at this moment. For the first time in the history of our nation, a political party has nominated a Negro woman for the second highest office in the land. Bass was labeled a radical the federal government investigated her as a potential communist. The post office tried to revoke her postage permit for the California Eagle. She sold the paper in 1951, and it continued publication until 1964. I am very confident that within my lifetime, I will see first-class citizenship achieved for all my people, true democracy for all Americans. She's really been erased from national memory. In her 70s, Bass transformed the garage of her home into a community reading room and voter registration site. Living long enough to witness the legislative victories of the civil rights movement. Bass died in 1969. She was 81. What most inspires me about Charlotta Bass is her fearlessness. She had such a sense of obligation, not just to her own people, but to justice. I think she certainly helped create a path for someone like myself to exist. I believe in a world of good. The battle is not won nor the struggle past, but I know the future will be even better. Um, so let's move on with the show. We're delighted to have Susan Anderson with us today guiding the show. She's currently the history curator and program manager at the California African American Museum. A third generation California, her research and curatorial work has included posts as the director of collections, library exhibition and programs at the California Historical Society, interim chief curator at the African American Museum and Library at Oakland, Managing Director of LA as Subject and Curator at UCLA Library Special Collections. Her book, African Americans and the California Dream is forthcoming from Heyday Books. So thanks to our panelists and over to you, Susan. 
Thank you so much, Julie. And greetings to everyone. Thank you for joining us. What can we learn from artifacts of California elections? We're living in a historic period when the importance of voting and access to the vote is under fierce debate and consideration. In the United States, we've experienced many such urgent moments in our history. And our program today is going to explore this electoral pass as it unfolded in California. We're going to explore our history in a distinctive way through the eloquence of artifacts in archives from around the state. And we have a stellar group to guide our discussion, people who work in some of the most important archives in the country, and all of them are located here in California. I've been fortunate also, I want to add, to have worked with just about everybody on this panel. Um, the panelists have each chosen one artifact from the collections where they work. And they're going to share their knowledge about these objects and how the objects provide clues about uh, the history of voting in California. And after all of the panelists have individually presented, we're gonna open the discussion to questions from you, the audience. I'm going to introduce everyone first. I want you to know what treats you have in store and who you're gonna be hearing from. And after the introductions to the panelists, we're gonna move into our individual presentations. So I'm very pleased to let you know that our, our panelists are uh, first Tamara Martin, She's the state archivist at the California State Archives where she works to expand the archives digital footprint and provide greater public access to the treasures of California history. As state archivist, Tamara serves as the state coordinator for the California Historical Records Advisory Board and as an ex officio member of the California Historic State Capital Commission. And next, you're going to hear from Francis Kaplan. Francis is the reference and outreach librarian at the California Historical Society, where her focus is connecting audiences with CHS's diverse collections through research, exhibitions, and programming. And we also have Javiera Flores, who is the librarian and archivist at the UCLA Chicano Studies Center. Javiera oversees all library archives and museum services as, and is integral to the center's mission and dedication to the development of a scholarly uh, approach to research on the Chicano Latino population. Uh, Javiera has worked in libraries since 2004 and specializes in archives management, audiovisual preservation and community archives. We'll, you are gonna also be hearing from Sean Dickerson. Sean is the archives assistant at the African American Museum and Library at Oakland or AMLO as it's affectionately known, a special division of the Oakland Public Library. And it's dedicated to the discovery, preservation, interpretation and sharing of historical and cultural experiences of African Americans in California and the West. AMLO's archives include more than 160 collections documenting prominent families, pioneers, churches, social and political organizations. And our last panelist, the last person you'll be hearing from is Angela Brinskelly. Angela is the Director of Communications of the June L. Mazur Lesbian Archives in Los Angeles, one of the largest and oldest archives in the country dedicated to lesbian and feminist history. And she's been with June Mazur for 15 years. So that is our group. We're very lucky to have all of you. Thank you for being here and welcome. 
And um, let's get right into it. We're going to start with Tamara Martin, our California State Archivist. And uh, Tamara, what are you sharing with us today? Good afternoon. Thank you so much for having me. Uh, so today I wanted to share with you uh, these documents from the Civil War times. So uh, as you'll see on your screen, there are two separate uh, ballot or election ticket. So there's a union state ticket that you can see on your left. Uh, there is also one on the right and then in the center is a muster roll. So today I thought I would provide a little bit of background information about how vote by mail started in California and it actually started with the Civil War. So the Civil War left its mark on many aspects of American life, including our elections and voting. California's first vote by mail occurred during the Civil War in 1863. So at the start of the war in 1861, most of the federal army was stationed in forts across the Western United States and more than 16,000 Californians volunteered to serve in the war. And most of these soldiers helped to fill the void left when federal troops were transferred to the Eastern Front. As California soldiers fought on battlefields stretching from Virginia to Arizona, another struggle was being waged in California in the legislature and the courts to secure and protect the rights of these soldiers to vote while they were deployed. In 1863, Governor Leland Stanford urged the California legislature to allow California's new soldiers to vote and the legislature obliged um, and the governor signed an act that allowed them to vote uh, as fully as if they were entitled to vote in elections in counties in person. Um, the new law in 1863 allowed thousands of California soldiers stationed as far north as the Canadian border and as far south as the Mexican border, border and as far east as Texas to vote for their elected officials. Members of the famed California 100, which fought east of the Mississippi River and as a part of the 2nd Massachusetts Cavalry, actually gathered on September 2nd, 1863 to cast their ballots at their post in Virginia. So you can see here that these records actually were from, from that group. So they would uh, cast their ballot by uh, political party tickets. So you can see here uh, for governor, it has Frederick Lowe on the left and then for governor Emperor Norton. Um, and then they would use the muster rolls here in the center to check off who had, who had voted. So the constitutionality of the new law was actually quickly challenged. Uh, John Borland, who had lost a close election for the sheriff of uh, one of the counties in California in September of 1863 brought a case that was eventually decided by the California Supreme Court in 1864. His opponent, George Hildreth, had won the election by such a narrow margin that he actually would have lost if the soldiers' ballots had not been counted. As the California Supreme Court eventually decided that the law was indeed unconstitutional, and they ruled that a soldier must cast his ballot within the boundaries of the county in which he resided at the time of his enlistment in order for the vote to be counted. Uh, this uh, decision was overturned, or, or this decision overturned uh, the right for the soldiers to vote um, by mail remotely. So uh, it was as severely criticized by the press and the legislature soon passed another act uh, soon thereafter to protect soldiers voting rights the second law specifically allowed soldiers to vote for members of the state legislature, for members of Congress, and for presidential electors, and the Supreme Court ruling would have no effect on those particular races. And so about eight months later, after the legislation again passed into law and it allowed California soldiers to vote, they were able to cast ballots in the presidential election in 1864. And so, uh, as, as we all know, uh, President Lincoln won re-election that year with the support of over 70% of the votes of all Union soldiers and sailors nationwide. Lincoln's support among military voters was higher than his support among civilian voters. He won 55% of the overall popular vote. And the president won California's five electoral votes by less than 20,000 votes with backing from the California soldiers, uh, providing a critical boost by their vote by mail ballots. You can actually learn more about vote by mail ballots. We have an online exhibit about it, which is uh, available in both English and Spanish. And I believe the, the links will be provided to you. But also I did just want to mention, um, you can also register to vote yourself uh, at our website, the sos.ca.gov. So um, when you were 
pulling together your research about the Civil War ballots in California, you must have heard echoes of recent debates in your mind. Oh, absolutely. There definitely is a tie in between primary source documents and some of the historical records that we see at the state archives that were created, you know, over 100 years ago to things we're seeing in the news and that are happening today. And I think it's a great source of, of history, but also background material that can definitely help us to uh, put together uh, background information and arguments for support or against different issues. And reminding people again, according to our, our theme today, that this is, was, is the origin of, of mail-in ballots uh, in our history. Of course, this debate was going on across, across the country and, and the Supreme Court, both in California and the United States was dealing with this as an issue. But this is how absentee ballots and mail-in ballots originated. I'm recognizing a couple of names on the Union State ticket. <laughs> Wonderful, yes, I see Cornelius Cole who ran, who became a US Congressman. He uh, actually was a lawyer in several anti-slavery uh, court cases. Wonderful. Did you wanna add anything else, Tamara? Uh, I would just say, you know, if you're interested in learning more um, beyond what's offered in the exhibit, you can always contact us here at the State Archives and we can provide additional information. This particular collection, actually, we have um, hundreds of different ballots that were collected as well as lots of muster rolls that you can see. Um, unfortunately, due to the ongoing pandemic, we are closed to visit in person, but when we do reopen, we are available for you to come view these in person as well. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much, Tamara, and there are folks in the audience, uh, save your questions if you have questions for Tamara about these wonderful artifacts. Well, we're going to move on. We, we brought up the topic of women running for office. I want to say very quickly that um, Charlotta Bass, uh, many people learned uh, when Kamala Harris, our current vice president, was running for office, um, that the first person, first Black woman to run for vice president was another Californian, Charlotta Bass. And interestingly, Charlotta Bass ran on a ticket with Vincent Hallinan when Kamala Harris won for district attorney many years later, the candidate that she beat was the grandson of Vincent Hallinan in San Francisco. So women uh, in office, we're gonna move on to Frances Kaplan of the California Historical Society and find out what Frances brought for us. Thank you, Susan. And I think Charlotte is a great introduction to this, actually, because she was also part of the suffrage movement, having moved to Los Angeles not long before the 1911 um, uh, vote and, um, and was very active in writing articles, you know, supporting suffrage. So that's my lead in. And, but today I want to focus on a broadside from the California Historical Society's collection of suffrage materials. This broadside actually takes us back nine years before the 19th Amendment to 1911 when women in California were campaigning to win the right to vote within our state. The battle for suffrage here was not a new one. In 1893, the California legislature actually passed a bill recognizing women's suffrage rights, but the governor at the time vetoed it. And then in 1896, three years later, suffrage was actually put on the ballot as California Amendment 6, but it failed with less than 50% of the vote. This artifact can actually tell us quite a lot about the 1911 campaign and I think about earlier ones as well. So although undated, we know it was created around 1911 because of the other states and countries it lists. So it says uh, Washington and women in Washington state obtained suffrage in 1910. We also learn from it immediately that suffrage was definitely a global movement. The broadside places California suffrage within a national and international context which I think is very interesting to look at. The broadside also reveals some things about at least one of the organized groups involved in the movement. 
You might not be able to see the small print, but you have to trust me, down in the small print, it actually says that this particular campaign material was created by the College Equal Suffrage League, which was a national organization begun in 1900, aimed at getting college and college educated women involved in the movement. So earlier campaigns were predominantly led by white, married, middle-class Protestant women, but the 1911 campaign would not have succeeded had the suffrage coalition not broadened its support base. An example of the work that was done by the College Equal Suffrage League can be seen in the efforts of one of their members, Maria de Lopez. She was a teacher at UCLA. She was a member of the LA-based Votes for Women Club. And in 1911, she became president of her local chapter of the College Equal Suffrage League. Um, de Lopez was actually responsible for getting many of the suffrage leaflets translated into Spanish. And she herself traveled the state giving speeches in Spanish and English, including one famous speech a week before the election that drew a crowd of thousands in Los Angeles Plaza. So what else can we learn from this broadside? Well, it's actually a wonderful example of the kinds of promotional material that the 1911 campaign created and used. Um, perhaps I should have mentioned this at the beginning, but a broadside by definition is a single sheet of paper with a printed message, usually on one side, that is intended to be posted, publicly distributed or sold. And again, down in the very small print, it says 10 cents the hundred. So the goal when the College Equal Suffrage League produced this broadside was for people to actually buy multiple copies and distribute them widely. It's surviving materials such as these that are all evidence of the organizing, the promoting, the strategies and the messaging that was implemented in the lead up to this election. In the first campaign, meetings were held in private homes and very private spaces. But in contrast, the second campaign used a lot of grassroots campaigning and it was very public. Meetings were in public halls, in churches, people went door to door, town to town, and for the first time, women marched in the streets. The 1911 campaign, a little bit like this broadside itself, was big and bold and very visible. The other thing this broadside brings our attention to are the different kinds of suffrage that you have on offer. You've got full suffrage, such as in Australia and Norway and Finland, etc. You've got municipal suffrage and school suffrage. Well, it shows that women were at times offered voting rights in some areas, but in the hope that they would not fight for rights in other areas. Another example from California is in also in 1893, where the governor vetoed a bill that would have allowed women just to vote in school elections. And the reasoning that I read was that he said women could not be trusted to go to the ballot box and purely mark the school election ballot and not touch anything else. So then we come up to another thing I want to point out about the broadside, which is that it brings up comparisons with other states, which begs the question, well, how did they get the vote? What was going on there? And what did the suffrage leaders learn from that? Well, one takeaway um, was that the importance of the rural vote. So 42 years before California women could vote, legislators passed the Wyoming Suffrage Act of 1869 that gave women in that territory the right to vote and hold public office. So lawmakers there pretty much understood that women played an integral role in life on the frontier and should have a voice in how the territory was run. And chances are you weren't gonna get a lot of women going there if they didn't have a say in how that was going to be. So something really became clear as they looked at these other states. Suffrage was heavily contested in urban and densely populated areas. So cities in California, such as San Francisco and Oakland, were very influenced by the liquor trade and saloon owners, and they completely opposed female suffrage, convinced that women would vote for prohibition. So knowing that the cities would be a tight call and knowing that suffrage had passed in states with rural voters, California suffrage leaders for this 1911 campaign very strategically went after the rural vote. And the strategy paid off because men from the San Fernando, San Joaquin and Sacramento Valleys, the three major farming areas in the state, all overwhelmingly voted yes. This was a really, really important campaign. California won the right to vote in 1911 by a mere 3,587 votes. That's just 50.73%. If you compare that to the one in 1896 that failed, they got, I think 44, 46% of the vote. So they worked all those years to just scratch it by. But it did pass. And when it did, because of the population of California, the number of women with full suffrage in the United States 
actually immediately doubled. And this gave other states and possibly even other countries the incentive to keep up the fight. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. The California campaign in 1911 was so formative and influential that suffragists around the country pre, uh, going after suffrage in, in their own states created what they called the California model. Mm -hmm. And they uh, emulated the, the collaboration with working class men and women and ethnic groups and the bold PR strategies. And when you read the press at that time and look at the media, there's all this talk about the California model for suffrage campaigns. One of the things about that, one of the unfortunate things was the one group that the white women suffragists did not work with were the black women suffragists. Mm -hmm. And that was a, a form of segregation they were not willing to give up. Uh, what, would you say that um, a strength of the collections at the California Historical Society are these materials about women's suffrage? Yes, I actually think so, because I, I sort of include materials related to women's suffrage as being kind of anything that shows in that lead up, women's sort of social and political power on, and, and their attempts to get it. So one of the things we have in our archives is a lot of material related to early women's groups, starting off with the women's, um, the Siemens Friends Society and going into the League of Women Voters and, uh, and all the campaigning that they did around getting the, the votes for schools, but also just, you know, it started off as that, like you said, that sort of white middle class, helping, you know, they were sort of helping society. So it was orphans and children and women, uh, getting women out of the Barbary Coast and, and into other employment and not always welcome, by the way. But you can really see the, the continuum that goes from uh, about learning how they learned to campaign. Because how are you supposed to learn how to do all of this? So you have to start by having organizations, creating meetings, places, um, running minutes, you know, finding political allies and all of that, you can sort of see the span of how women in California got better and better at doing that until it came to the 1911 election where it sort of all, we didn't all come together, but it came together enough to get the vote. It came together enough. Thank you so much, Francis. And I, I just want to remind the audience that if you have questions about this wonderful artifact, keep them saved for our question and answer. And uh, we're going to move along. Um, the next person that we're going to hear from is Javier Flores with the Chicano Studies Research Center at UCLA about this wonderful image that's on the screen right now. Thanks, Susan. Um, so the artifact that I chose um, I chose this because of what we see in the picture and what it represents. The images of Edward R. Royball um, and his wife, Lucille and his two daughters, um, Lucille and Lillian. Um, and this is a picture that was taken basically moments after he won the election to the Los Angeles City Council in May of 1949. Um, so like I said, not, I, I love it for like also not what you, not just what you see that he's with his family and he's with the, um, uh, campaign organizers, uh, the night of the win, but also what it represents in the larger scheme. Um, this was a historic moment on several levels. He was the, Roy Ball was uh, the first person of Mexican descent to be elected uh, onto the city council um, and in, in California government since the, they say late 1800s. Um, so it was a huge win in that respect, but also he represented not just Mexicans and Mexican Americans, but um, all BIPOC and underrepresented communities. He really won this election with the support of the Jewish community, the Asian community and the African-American community. Um, he rallied around um, 
voter registration and uh, civic engagement and, and getting these communities to uh, speak out for the issues uh, that affect them the most and which really hit hard with, with all of these communities, not just Mexicans and Mexican Americans. This was also what would be the beginning of what would be a 13 years on the Los Angeles City Council. And then his move to 30 years in Congress, again, as a, a first, um, as a first Latino US representative for California since the 1800s. Um, and even when he retired from Congress in 1993, he, uh, he continued to advocate for the community and work in providing public health services um, in, in Los Angeles and California and across the states. So I think too, it's good to know about this, this photograph. Um, I guess I should also say that this photograph is part of the um, Edward R. Royball papers, which is at the Chicano Studies Research Center. And I think online it says in the finding need, it says it's about 700 boxes, but it's actually closer to 1200 boxes. So it's a very large collection, very well documented, and there are tons of photographs. But again, this one's pretty iconic um, one that I really wanted to share with, with everyone because of that kind of um, momentous kind of historical point and point in time for him. He also represented a lot of people in the fact that, you know, um, with Mexican Americans that, you know, he was born during the Mexican Revolution, which affected a lot of families in the, in the US, um, um, especially in states in the Southwest that used to be part of Mexico. So he was born in 1916. Uh, he was a child during World War One. He survived having the Spanish flu, um, which uh, although two of his siblings did not survive, they passed away. And that's where people root back um, his, his advocacy for health and public health services from. Um, and, you know, he was a teenager during the Great Depression and, um, and was very influenced by or not influenced, but impacted by the discrimination around him at the time, because at the time of the Great Depression, you then have Mexican repatriation, which for those of you who don't know, uh, historians estimate to, from 200,000 to 2 million um, Latinos, people of Mexican, Mexican-American descent or Mexican descent were sent back to Mexico, even though many of them were US citizens. Um, and then to be thrown into being drafted into World War II, um, uh, to where you know he fought for you know he fought for this country, and then um, came back to where there were still the same issues of housing housing rights and issues and discrimination, um, fair employment discrimination, uh, police brutality was something that he ended up um, rallying to uh, address. Um, you, uh, better programs for youth and, and so forth. So, um, and he, he lived in Boyle Heights, which was at that time, very, not just uh, Mexican American, Mexican Americans, but also Jewish communities and Asian communities. So where he experienced Mexican repatriation. He also felt the pain of, you know, in the 40s of the Japanese re relocations, where again, a huge part of the community just disappeared. So he really had a lot of connections, not just to Mexican Americans, but to a lot of people in Los Angeles, and just for basic, basic human rights and, and civil rights and needs. So um, having him, him win in 1949, really had a huge impact for more people having having a voice in, in these elections. Um. Thank you, Javiera. I, a couple of things. I mean, first of all, this is a beautiful photograph. Um, we talked about it when you first showed it to us, the composition of it, it's very striking. I don't know who the photographer is, but it's a, it's a, he was, whoever it was, was, is a great photographer. And uh, Roy Ball's biography is so impressive. 
Hmm. Um, and then, of course, Lucille, his daughter Lucille, was also elected to the Congress. So there's a kind of almost political dynasty there with his daughter. Um, but maybe, you know, you could talk a little bit before we move on about the importance of his campaign and his career. Um, I know, for instance, that a very young Tom Bradley worked on the Roy Ball campaign, this city council campaign, helping to get out the vote in uh, the Central Avenue district in Los Angeles. And Roy Ball's ability to put coalitions together um, is partly what got him elected, but also kind of served as a inspiration uh, to other communities and other people uh, running for office. Yeah, if, if, you know, if, if you look at, you know, the archives and yeah, his biography is great and, and there's a lot of great um, books coming out too that'll go into, that go into this more. Um, he, he was just really great at organizing um, and working with people. And he attributed that to also the fact that he um, worked for the California Tuberculosis Association. Um, and as part of that, he had this mobile x-ray um, facility. And so he would um, basically give people screenings in the community. So he was really in the community boots on the ground meeting new people. Um, and, you know, I think uh, from what I remember, you know, he kind of realized that, you know, oh, I should get, you know, more like civically engaged. And he actually ran in 1947, um, but that campaign did not go very well because he started really late in the game and he lost, but it really kind of um, gave him the itch to to continue forward and, and put something else into the works, which was the community service organization. Yes, he was, he was an organizer at heart, wasn't he? Yeah, yeah. And there he met like really great other organizers like Fred Ross and Burke Corona. Um, and oh, I'm blanking on on the name. I'll, I'll, I'll find it, you know, what people are well, going Saul through their Linsky. stuff. <laughs> yes, yeah, Saul Linsky. Um, and and yeah, and the thing too is that the CSO and like other, let's say the, you know, um, mutual aid or other organizations in the community, especially like the ones for, for Mexican Americans, there was no citizen requirement. So it also included immigrants, um, I think, which really made it inclusive because it really was an immigrant community as well. Um, and I think that's where also too, he really got a lot of like the Jewish vote and, and the Asian vote, so. Wonderful, um, thank you so much. There's yeah. so much rich history connected with each and every one of these artifacts. And um, we're, I'm sure there are people who are gonna have questions for you. What we're gonna do is move on to the next presenter. And it turns out that's me. Um, at least that's what I have in my notes. Yes, that's me. And um, I, I also was asked to include this, an artifact. And we're going to take a look at this, which this print is part of a collection at the California uh, African American Museum, CAM, uh, of paintings and lithographs by Los Angeles artist uh, Charles Haywood. It's mid 20th century. We don't know the exact date. It's very bold, graphic, encouraging young people to vote. Um, and it was one of the illustrations accompanying a blog I published on the CAM website right after the right uh, around the November uh, 3rd election, 2020, uh, which was called the election of a lifetime. And the point was that for African-Americans, this recent election was a call to arms um, and that the battle was joined when it came to um, the history of restrictions on the black vote and attempts to suppress the black vote today. And that this election and, and, and sort of the dramatic energy around the election is a reminder um, that American in throughout our history, 
the right to vote has been denied to many people, to women, uh, women, indigenous people, those with Asian ancestry, residents of the District of Columbia have all had to campaign and struggle for their access to the ballot. Um, and historic fights over this access have their roots in the US history of slavery and resistance to slavery and, def and defining the meaning of citizenship. And many people aren't aware uh, about how these conflicts were expressed in California, uh, in California politics and California elections. But this history had, a ver had very um, uh, strong expressions in California. One example is that in 1870, when Congress passed the 15th Amendment to the US Constitution providing access to the ballot for African-American men, in January of that year, when the California legislature convened to, to vote as the rest of the states were voting on ratification, the legislature was back in the hands of pro-slavery, uh, even though it was after the Civil War, pro-Southern, uh, pro-slavery uh, politicians in California, and California's legislature decisively rejected the 15th Amendment in 1870. In fact, the California legislature did not ratify any of the Reconstruction Amendments, and it took until 1962 before the California legislature ratified um, the, 15th, the 15th Amendment. Clerks, and so what happened was that there were challenges around the state by clerks in, in voter registration offices um, to black men who showed up to register for the vote in 1870. And this happened in San Jose, it happened in Stockton, it happened in Sacramento, it happened in Nevada City, San Francisco, Los Angeles, and other places that the registrar's offices resisted or tried to prohibit African-American men from registering to vote. And just lastly, I'll say that around uh, the piece that I wrote, um, looking at the history and looking at California, that the politics of citizenship and voting are deeply ingrained in African-American culture. That includes California. You can see that from the video clip about Charlotta Bass, who even in retirement was registering people to vote in her garage in Lake Elsinore. And going all the way back to the 19th century, um, where uh, voices like that of Philip Alexander Bell, who was the publisher of the Elevator newspaper published in San Francisco. And he wrote in 1867, we should leave no effort untried to obtain a full recognition of our citizenship and all the rights, privileges, and, and immunities appertaining thereto. We are neglectful of our duty to ourselves, to our country, and to pos posterity if we do not appreciate our political rights enough to demand them. As I said, that was published in the Elevator newspaper in 1867, but it could have been published yesterday in Atlanta, Georgia. I'm going to move on to our next artifact and our next panelist. I'm happy to have Sean Dickerson uh, here to talk to us about what he brought from AMLO's collections. Yeah, thank you, Susan, and thank you, California Humanities, for having me here today. Um, <clears throat> and Susan, I think the artifact you just presented, the Charles Haywood illustration, looking at youth engagement around voter suppression, is a good lead way to the object I've chosen, um, <clears throat> which is from a collection at AMLO, the Charles Etta Bragg's Board Papers, um, that document the activities of the Richmond chapter and other regional chapters of the Congress of Racial Equality. Um, the Bragg's Ford papers were donated to the museum and library in 2016. We had them processed in 2017. 
Um, because I can never stop with just one, you'll see there's a second object in the lower right, uh, which is a Freedom Corps button uh, that comes from a collection of civil rights memorabilia collected by Edward G. Schaup, who was a member of the Berkeley chapter of Core. Um, now, in selecting these items not directly related to a specific California election, but documenting local direct actions from the civil rights era, um, what Susan earlier called an urgent moment, I hope to draw connections between historic Bay Area protests against racial discrimination, landmark civil rights legislation, including the passage of the Rumford Fair Housing Bill in 1963, uh, and the campus free speech movement and the emerging black power movements that galvanized youth activism. Um, so this item, uh, the Don't Shop a Hinks flyer, uh, was a protest against Hinks department store, a fixture of downtown Berkeley on Shattuck Avenue. For those of you who know Berkeley well, <clears throat> the building is now home to the landmark Shattuck cinemas. Um, the, the, the demonstrations began on December 2nd, 1961 as the Berkeley chapter of the Congress of Racial Equality picketed for failure to hire any African-American salesperson in its 57 year history. Um, and as we read the flyer together, it says, most people in Berkeley regard racial discrimination as a Southern problem. But Hinks, the largest department store in Berkeley and a locally owned store has held to a white only employment policy for all its 57 years. Other stores, both local and national, have adopted a fair employment policy, hiring on the basis of competence regardless of race, without ill effects to their business, but not Hinks. Berkeley's Negro community is represented on the city council and on the school board, but not behind Mr. Hinks' counters. Of course, Hinks happily accepts the patronage of people they would not hire. And indeed, according to the 1960 US Civil Rights Commission report of the Berkeley Study Committee on Equal Employment Opportunities, serious problems of discrimination in hiring existed in the Bay Area at the time, <clears throat> finding in grocery stores, for example, only 1.5% of a total of 269 employees observed working in a representative sample of 35 stores were African-Americans. Similarly, in 20 banks, the only African-American employee observed was one maintenance man. Um, only two African-Americans were observed in sales positions in a representative sample of department variety and specialty stores. Now, the 1961 um, Hinks boycott by Berkeley Corps ultimately won a victory with Hinks hiring two retailers. Um, this, in turn, inspired more ambitious direct action campaigns against Berkeley City Realtors in 1962 and resulted in a fertile period of local core chapter store demonstrations, including those against the East Bay Montgomery Ward. <clears throat> These actions were situated in what's been described as a transitional period for core, a period in the early 1960s when distinctions between various activist groups were not especially clear. Members of the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee, or SNCC, were also members of CORE. Often actions would be sponsored by CORE one weekend, another group the next. According to the authors of Prophets of Rage, the Black Freedom Struggle in San Francisco in 1945 to 1969, Bay Area CORE groups remained frustrated in these years, requesting information from National CORE on methods utilized by other groups. By the summer of 1959, in fact, the San Francisco group was largely inactive, and by November 1961, the local Oakland chapter was formally dissolved. Now, new membership in 1961 um, engaged in this, this such action with Hinks, um, many of whom had been freedom riders involved with actions down south, began turning their attentions back to actions in the Bay. Uh, for the National Office of Corps, these kind of store demonstrations, such as at Hinks, served a dual function. They aided the Southern movement, including voter registration drives throughout the South, and stimulated core activity in the West. Uh, as local core chapters strengthened their attention conditions in the Bay Area, they were able to use direct action techniques to build a strong base of support. Uh, these demonstrations sparked other protests during the next several years, ultimately leading to the creation of the United San Francisco Freedom Movement in the spring of 1963. The, um, or US FFM. The US FFM consisted of groups like CORE, the NAACP, the Ad Hoc Committee to End Discrimination, and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee. 
the USSFM began a campaign of sit-ins and other demonstrations in San Francisco that began to attract increasing attention from students at UC Berkeley and SF State. These, uh, they were responsible for demonstrations against Mel's drive-in in October 1963, as well as large protests at the Sheraton Palace Hotel in January 64, along Otto Row in February, and at the Bank of America in April. Perhaps the greatest achievement of USFFM came in December 1963 when it signed an agreement with the Retailers Community Group, <clears throat> which promised to, an end to job discrimination and which stated that stores must comply with the agreement or they would get dropped from the Retailers Group. Uh, this was the climate in which Richmond Corps chapter formed in 1963 by Miss Braxford. Um, 1963, a defining year for the civil rights movement in the wake of King's March on Washington and the Birmingham campaign led by the Southern Christian Leadership Conference. It was a crucial pivotal year for Bay Area activism that drew increasing statewide attention to issues around discrimination in housing and employment. Um, in 1963, William Byron Rumford, the first African-American elected to state public office in Northern California, introduced Assembly Bill 1240, known as the Rumford Fair Housing Bill. Um, the act had evolved from the larger civil rights struggles that emerged over the creation of a permanent fair employment practices commission at the state level. Core activists supported the Rumford Housing Act with a two week sit-in at the state capitol, beginning with a four day freedom walk from Berkeley on May 27th of that year. Protest protesters at the sit-in included Arlene Slaughter, owner of Central Realty Service um, in North Oakland and an advocate for fair housing, along with her young daughter, Frederica, who later married Black Par Panther Party co-founder, Dr. Huey P. Newton. The Rumford Act was signed into law by Governor Pat Brown on September 20th, 1963, but following its passage in 64, the California Real Estate Association funded a campaign in Proposition 14 to quickly repeal and re-legalize discrimination and associational privacy by landlords and property owners. Um, many cite this proposition as one of the causes of the Watts riots in 65, as well as being an initiative that Ronald Reagan rode to political power in the state. Um, this same year <clears throat> in Richmond, Braggs Ford, who was a nursing supervisor at Kaiser Hospital in Oakland, together with Savannah Van Dyke Bellow, filled out the paperwork to set up the office for a Richmond chapter of CORE. They were an all African-American CORE chapter led by working class women that also held close ties with the Berkeley campus CORE through its chairman, Jack Weinberg. Richmond CORE's first major direct action was a 64 sit-in against the Richmond Housing Authority Board that attracted the attention of other local chapters, including those in Berkeley, Oakland, San Francisco, as well as the Berkeley campus CORE. Negotiation, the negotiation team included um, Savannah Van Dyke Bellow, Charles Edda Braggs Ford, Jack Weinberg, and David Friedman of Campus Corps. Um, and a significant victory was won following their long series of public negotiations with the Board of Commissioners of the Richmond Housing Authority that led to adoptions of stronger anti discrimination resolutions in Richmond. Now, Jack Weinberg on the negotiating team. Um, of course, is best known for his connection with the free speech movement. After his arrest for distributing core literature on UC Berkeley's campus in October 1964, students spontaneously surrounded the police car in which he was placed, and as lore would have it, the 60s youth movement was born. In fact, in accounts of the negotiations with Richmond's housing authority, Weinberg claimed to still have been feeling the effects of 36 hours in a police car. Um, Weinberg himself has spoken about his close working relationship with the Richmond chapter of CORE, although scholarly interest in the interconnectedness of Richmond CORE and Berkeley's campus CORE has been underexplored. Um, as noted by the Oakland Museum of California's picture this California perspectives on American history, they say this free speech movement not only symbolized the power of student activism, but the influence of the civil rights movement on California students. And as quoted in the Correlator newspaper themselves, it is inadequate, as we have seen, to characterize the free speech movement as a purely on-campus phenomenon, as a protest stemming from a long overdue need for university reform, or as a response to a corrupt or insensitive administration. Invariably, when students become politically and socially active, one can find that at the root, they are responding to their society's most basic problems. So by the mid to late 1960s, this younger civil rights leadership was emerging in the Bay Area using these nonviolent direct action tactics. Um, it brought together student activists and paralleled the rise of black militancy. 
As for Richmond Corps, in 1968, the chapter wrote the Western regional officers to disaffiliate formally, relaying that their core members were beginning to participate in other groups and community organizing, including the Black Panthers. Um, Black power would itself, of course, lead to the creation of new political and cultural institutions, leading to profound implications for subsequent California politics. Wonderful, John. Um, I don't think a lot of people recognize the extent of the civil rights movement in the Bay Area. And your presentation really began to give us a, a picture of that. I don't think people realize the extent of segregation in the Bay Area and in, there, and in other places in, Cal, in a place like California. And Absolutely. I don't think people realize the extent of the civil rights movement. Absolutely. And as you mentioned, just in this recent election, kind of <clears throat> the connections between local organizers responding to Southern civil rights movement through funds and through actions being as important today as, uh, as in this historic moment. Thank you so much. This is just quite wonderful. I want to mention that if people have questions, um, one of the values we're seeing, I feel the value of these archives and these collections. And in the case of AMLO, uh, the documentation of something like the civil rights movement in the Bay Area, is, it's there. It can be written about, researched, talked about. We need to see more, you know, more about our own history in this state. Thank you so much, Sean. And we're going to move along. Um, very pleased to uh, introduce Angela Brinskelly uh, with the June L. Mazur Lesbian Archive. And um, Angela's going to let us know what she has to share. Um, thank you, Susan. Uh, this is an artifact from our periodicals in the archives. Um, it is the cover of Broomstick, which was a self-published radical feminist magazine that came uh, out of Berkeley, California in 1978. It lasted till around 1993, or exactly, so, <laughs> until 1993. Uh, the women who started this and ran the periodical and the women who read it were uh, women for um, feminists and lesbian activists um, they were women over 40. They also, as you probably would assume, didn't mind if you thought they were all witches. Um, they fought fiercely for the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, they also fought for uh, anti-ageism um, against women. And um, the women who founded this magazine were Maxine Spencer and Polly Taylor. So uh, I wanted to talk more about the Equal Rights Amendment um, where it pertains to feminists and especially lesbian women. Um, the Equal Rights Amendment, I'm just gonna say it because that's what a feminist would do right now. Equality of rights under the law shall not be denied or abridged by the United States or any state on account of sex. I was recently talking to a lesbian, longtime lesbian feminist um, Mary Lou Manoff, who, who quoted that to me immediately and said, it's just one little sentence. And I could tell that she's been saying that for, you know, 40 years. Um, uh, she was in the Valley chapter of um, Now, and she said that about 80% of her chapter was lesbian, and the 20% that wasn't were men and women who were very um, open-minded and very easy to work with, and they all wanted the Equal Rights Amendment to pass. Um, she had a very unique experience in that way, I would say, because lesbians, lesbians usually had a rough road even fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment, because originally in NOW, the National Organization for Women, not of women, um, in NOW, there was a lot of uh, homophobia and there are stories on the East and West Coast of lesbians being kicked out of now. On the West Coast, it was uh, Robin Tyler and Jean Cordova telling stories about being kicked out of now meetings um, when they were there to fight for the Equal Rights Amendment and other feminist uh, rights, other women's rights. Um, 
um, most feminist and lesbian activists who were fighting for the Equal Rights Amendment uh, were also fighting for women's rights in all different places, in the work field, um, uh, for women of color, all, all different things. Um, on the East Coast, uh, Ivy Bettini and Rita Mae Brown um, have very famous stories about being thrown out of now also. I remember Rita, Brown, Rita Mae Brown saying afterwards, she used to call now, now what? So they had a real struggle beyond just fighting for their, their rights as women. And I just wanted to talk about how different it was for a lot of lesbians. Um, this magazine was also um, very separatist minded and separatist women, I think, uh, had that mindset because they felt like patriarchy and sexism was so intense in their world that some of them just opted out of doing anything with men ever again because they felt that as long as they were around men, sexism could never be um, diminished or out of their lives. So that's kind of a really quick summary of uh, the difference in the fight for lesbians um, than just uh, feminist women who were fighting for the ERA. Um, let me see. I, I wanted to point out one website too, because the Equal Rights Amendment is still, I think one of the hardest things for me today is that the Equal Rights Amendment has still not been a uh, part of our constitution. Alex Paul uh, wrote it and uh, presented it almost a hundred years ago, and yet we still don't have it. However, uh, now today, um, because of all this uh, canvassing neighborhoods and uh, going to different states uh, to canvass neighborhoods in conservative states, a lot of feminist and lesbian women and their allies have gotten enough states to actually ratify the ERA today. And so now it's literally waiting in the Senate and the House to, um, to pass. And people are worried that it might not, even a hundred years later. <laughs> and that seems really ridiculous to me. I'm sure it does to a lot of people. Um, and we're not really sure if it's gonna make it actually. And one of the things that a lot of um, feminists in the seventies said that um, they used to call it the damn Senate because it got stuck in the Senate before. Um, so this is history repeating itself too. Um, let me see. Let's see. Um, what I also think is interesting about the Equal Rights Amendment is it was developed or created so long ago, and yet it's really for equal rights for people of all sexes. And I think I'm hopeful for the future in America that um, the millennials and younger generations uh, really, really would want this and see the importance of it. But I think a lot of them don't know about it. So that's why I'm always happy to talk about the Equal Rights Amendment. Um, because if we can get the future of the country behind it, I think it will, we'll have no problem getting it passed. Um, some of the things in the archives around the Equal Rights Amendment and the feminist movement are things like walking packets. You can go in the archives and see these documents where um, it teaches you exactly the facts about the Equal Rights Amendment and it shows you a map of a neighborhood that you can canvas, which means you go door to door and you talk to people about why they should vote for the Equal Rights Amendment. And so we have a lot of um, documentation of people learning from these walking packets and different precincts, um, how to talk to people at their front door and really get them to vote. Um, and it's a really brave thing to do, especially because a lot of feminists left very liberal states to go to very conservative states and walk door to door and ask people who had no inclination to vote for the Equal Rights Amendment to vote for it. And they had a packet of information that 
really educated them well on the facts of the Equal Rights Amendment and a persuasive argument for why we need it and why people should vote for it. Um, Uh, I was going to quote uh, Shirley Chisholm, who, when she gave an ERA speech shortly after she was the first African American person in Congress, she said, discrimination against women solely on the basis of their sex is so widespread that it seems to many persons to be normal, natural, and right. And I think that's um, one of the biggest battles against the Equal Rights Amendment and against sexism is that it seems like it's natural and right because we get information about it. We get sexist information before we're even verbal as babies and children. And so a lot of feminists believe that everyone has sexism in them, much like a lot of people can be very racist in a somewhat unconscious way sometimes because it's actually um, almost like propaganda from the time they were so young that they don't even remember that. Um, I don't know if I said that very well, but... Um, <laughs> Well, I, I want to thank you. Um, Shirley Chisholm wasn't the first African-American person in Congress. She was the first African-American woman in Congress. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, the first African-Americans were elected to Congress during Reconstruction after the Civil War. I do remember that. Um, but thank you for reminding me about that phrase, now what? I'd forgotten about that. But I do remember the campaign in the 70s, the ERA campaign. And, um, you know, we uh, one of our themes today, we've talked a little bit about, or at least um, are implying um, uh, uh, things about, about uh, bigotry and discrimination that we're dealing with in, in uh, our society and related to elections and certainly the bigotry in the, in the white feminist movement, um, you called that out talking about now. Um, there was even a term, um, uh, uh, Betty Friedan talked about the lavender menace and then um, lesbian women formed an organization and made t-shirts. Um, so we're all, wherever we are, uh, that's something that, that we're confronting. The ERA, the Equal Rights Amendment, I, I also think it was helpful to people for you to point out that it's, a, it's actually a live issue. It's not a dead issue. Yeah, I wanted to say, um, uh, Shirley Chisholm was the first African-American woman, right? Yes. But not the first African-American person, I see. Exactly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I, I, I wanted to just comment about what you said. The Lavender Menace was actually, just as you said, directly a response to the lesbians being thrown out of now. Exactly, exactly. Well, these, what I want to do is, is move on because you and your fellow panelists have given such extraordinarily wonderful presentations and we want the people who are viewing uh, this program to be able to get in on the discussion and, and have their questions relayed to you. So we're gonna go ahead and move on. Um, as I am thinking um, before I turn it over uh, so that we can relay questions from the audience, I am just thinking how so many of these California stories have, have still not been told. And I just think there's a dire need for us to have all kinds of venues to begin to, uh, you know, have conduits for this, this history that still uh, has to be revealed. And I'm very grateful to the Cal to California Humanities for being a primary place that supports 
the telling of these stories and the documentation of this history. Um, it's time for questions from the audience. We thank the uh, you all for hanging in with us. And I'm going to uh, turn it over to Kirsten Vega of California Humanities, who will be communicating your questions to our panelists. Hey, Susan, thanks so much. Yep, so if anyone has questions for any of the panelists, please just put them in the chat and I'll read them out loud. Um, Susan, I think in the meantime, we can go to some of the questions we had in our in our pocket. Well, I do. I have a question for everybody on the panel. And um, hold on, because it's right here. One of the things I wanted to ask uh, the panelists as our as our audience warms up and start sending in their question is um, why is it important? Uh, one of the things that has gone unsaid and we should say is that the materials that you've shown in your collections are accessible to the public. And um, we should, maybe you could talk about why it's important. And Javier, let's start with you. Why is it important? Why is access important? Why does that matter? Access is, is so important and it's actually one of my one of the reasons why I really love doing instruction and meeting with the students and working with our community partners and letting them know that because um, I myself as a as a library student felt intimidated by archives and I think there's just kind of this um, one the you know I think this image is just exists of like archives and museums is just being for a particular group of people. So kind of breaking that, that um, concept and, you know, just letting everyone know, especially like with us that we're open to everyone. You don't have to be uh, UCLA affiliated. And then with the students, researchers and, 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 you know, everyone that we work with really providing agency to the community to have them be in control of their, of their stories and letting them know that, you know, this, this archive that we have, yes, it's an academic archive, it's for research and teaching, but it's also our stories by us, for us and everyone else. And um, also really with students, really empowering them with showing them all the different ways they can access it. So they themselves can continue that, that story of empowerment also and, and showing that, you know, this, this is something that we've been struggling with since the beginning and we continue to do this. So um, yeah, access is super important and something that we think about a lot in terms of, you know, even though we're an archive and we love primary source materials, how do we make it digitized? How do we get it into K through 12? How do we um, make it accessible, you know, not just on computers, but also, you know, seeing how visible it is on mobiles so where there's still, I think like 35% of the Latino community doesn't have internet at home. So really understanding who our users are and being very inclusive and, and yeah, empowering them with this, this um, their own agency over their stories. Um, so access for me, like that, that's the key word here um, in providing that. Exactly. You know, um... Kirsten, I'm seeing a lot of comments. Um, so I, I mean, I'm sure we want to share some of those. Um, I want to find out though if Tamara, are, is, is Tamara, are you still there? I'm still Our here. state archivist. Hi there. Listen, could you address this issue of access, especially coming from our state archives, the record place of record for state history? Of course, so public access has been our number one objective since we were first created on January 5th, 1850. So for 170 years, uh, we've been providing public access to the records of the state of California. And it's especially important now during the ongoing pandemic to continually provide access opportunities for members of the public who may not be able to come to Sacramento due to travel restrictions or stay at home orders or a lot of state agencies have public counters that are closed right now. So it's 
you know, not only making sure that people are aware of what records you have and how they can help them in their daily lives or be useful to them for business purposes or personal purposes or other sort of benefit filings and things, but also um, making sure that you think of new and innovative ways to provide access to them during times that people can't physically come to your space. So I think um, just like what some of the other panelists have said, you know, it's extremely important to look at the state as a whole and who your customers are and who members of the public are and how they can access the information you're providing. So if they can't come in person and they don't have internet access. How can you get that information to them? Is it by mail or by phone or by dropping a postcard off at their house and really thinking of ways to make sure that the public is engaged with government and with its history and finding new ways to make sure you share that information. Everyone feels like they're a connected part of, of California and that they're they're all part of our, our state and our history and that they're ac accurately and adequately represented. Thanks. Now I'd love to go to some of the comments in the chat and some of the questions in the Q&A. Hey, so yeah, thanks everyone who's been writing to us in the chat. I see one question here for Francis. Um, someone is raising the question of the 1896 number change in which just two months before the election, the name of the proposition went from 11 to six. And can you comment on that, Francis? Oh my goodness. Out of all the questions you asked me one, I actually have no idea. Does somebody... <laughs> Does anybody else? Know? You know, I actually just recently wrote for California history about the these elections and and, and black women's and and black men's roles in the elections, and um, in the editing, we both the editor and I were both confused because the name kept changing, but neither one of us had any idea why. So that's I didn't find it in the literature, frankly the reason why. So let's well, let's move on to a different question. Yeah, we but we have something to um, we have something to now go off and research. <laughs> <laughs> They're a rabbit hole. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Well, we're getting a lot of engagement in the chat from, uh, you know, former election administrators and public school teachers. One question from a teacher was, um, I work in a mid-sized school in LA County, and do you have any advice to teachers who want to begin exploring archival resources in a way that wouldn't overwhelm them? Uh, and Started I think Francis has an answer <laughs> because uh, when we work together, uh, on something that the California Historical Society can share called Teaching California. Yes, it uh, is in still in beta testing stages, but we um, initiated a project with the California History Social Science Project working out of UC Davis. And it was to bring primary sources basically to K-12 education by really um, making sure that these primary sources fit in within the California state curriculum so that it would be incredibly useful for teachers. You could go and you can search by grade level. So if you're um, looking at grade one and you need to cover this particular standard, you could literally click and they'll And um, we're super excited about it. it. I would say it's halfway through. And you can see the beta website at teachingcalifornia.org. And there's already some sets up, so you can you can have a look at them. And we're hoping that by the end of 2021, it will it will launch. But yeah, it's really going back to sort of access. It is really important, I think, to try and get it to younger groups at an early age that that it's not just what you're told; it's what you can look at yourself, a primary source, and what and what you can get out of that. There's no right or wrong. I think when I was you know in school, you were so terrified of something being right or wrong. And now it's just about what, what do you see in that? And uh, I think that's really important when you look at all of these materials. I see a comment that interests me from Thomas K, um, who is asking if anyone put together a touring themed exhibit using political artifacts like we were showing today. And I the reason I'm reading that is I think it's a wonderful idea. And I think it could be a great next step uh, after this presentation to work together 
and maybe even bring in some more repositories to put together an exhibition that's very imaginative, um, utilizing political artifacts that help help tell California's unique history. And um, the touring idea, of course, this person understands that we are still in under pandemic restrictions, but there's always uh, what we museums are learning is there are virtual exhibits. Um, so that could that could be a start. And I, I'd like to just sort of say publicly, you know, that that might be something for us to, to think about that this um, person in the audience uh, had an idea about. Let's see, any more questions for panelists? Uh, I'm seeing a question here about a point that um, Francis raised, but perhaps others would have some comments too, about the fact that there was some um, sense that urban centers in California at the time of the suffrage movement might have been inclined towards, uh, you know, having anti-suffrage tendencies because there was a fear of um, temperance being brought in. And if, if there was any further information about how that narrative came about. Yeah, I mean, I think, again, I'm not a historian, but from my perspective, what I've read is that it's really started early. A lot of the, the, the early women's organizations uh, that were outside of the home were to do with um, sort of like this moral code of like, we're going to take care of people and we're going to take care of things and we're going to make things, everything's going to be better. And we're going to do that because we're going to stop people drinking, we're going to close, you know, we're going to stop drunkenness, we're going to not have uh, closed the dance halls down so that women don't have to work in them. So it, it was actually very tied with temperance and, and suffrage. And I think less so as it progressed, but um, they, you know, I don't think they were wrong in being worried, but it, I, the, the thing about the um, saloon owners and the, the, the whole liquor trade was that it was it was their whole negativity about it was based on that and they had a lot of power they had a ton of power so they were able to really lobby against it uh in a way well, the um per, uh suffrage was defeated in san francisco yes. even when it won on the ballot it, it was it was lost in, san and in oakland and by by a lot and in fact the chronicle announced that it had lost and um and it wasn't until a couple of days later when, again, the rural votes came in that it just pushed it over the edge. In LA, it just snuck in. Right. So, yeah, I mean, I would say it's one of the, would you, Susan, one of the main reasons that it was so hard fought and that it didn't pass in the cities was because- well, of women, the women, these were also anti-women forces. I mean, they, did, they were not interested in the welfare of women and children and families. And- um, so yeah, it was it was that there was an attempt to make the women look ridiculous, the ones who were concerned about um, you know the status of their families, their own safety, about the issue of alcoholism and drunkenness and violence in the home. They were made to seem ridiculous. It's a prejudice. It's a prejudice that we have in our society. Um, that still, I think it's still there, uh, but it was definitely turned against the women uh, as one of the weapons against suffrage. But as you mentioned, it, in 1911 in California, it didn't work. Um, and one of the interesting things, of course, is California was the sixth state to pass suffrage for women, but all of the first dozen states that passed suffrage laws that allowed women to vote were in the West, mm -hmm. which is a whole other area. I remember doing an interview some time ago with a reporter from the New York Times who just had no idea <laughs> that the Western part of the United States and California had been so far ahead of the of the East on, on, on these, on these issues, but. Susan, I'm, I'm seeing something in the chat that I think would interest a number of our panelists. The comment is San Pedro had a community action group in the 1960s and early seventies. It's
question. And then there's the larger question, which I know a lot of you have experience with, of how do items from grassroots groups and community groups make their way into formal and institutional archives? Yes, um, I, I'm not the only person who can answer, uh, but I'll, I'll get started as a curator, somebody who spent many years acquiring collections um, for institutions from many community organizations. Um, you know, the, the San Pedro group, um, what you wanna do is start thinking about where might be the best place. I am glad if you would like to talk to me, I would be glad to talk to you about what might be the most um, appropriate place for your materials. Um, and just, you know, looking around the state of California because you want them. I, you know, I love the community efforts to rescue and, and save materials, but I'm a big advocate of these materials being in institutional repositories so that they can be safe and secure so that they're not at risk and so that people can have access to them and because they belong there if the you know the treasures of humanity are in these collections our communities materials belong in these collections as well so um, I'm, you know, uh, through the, the California Humanities, you can reach, easily reach, get my email address if I can be of any help in helping you think through where your materials might find the, the best home. Anybody else? Yeah, I mean, we, we do, I do similar work in the sense of, um, I always do consultations when people have questions. I'm just like, I'm always free, you know, for people to answer questions because like, if I don't know the, as a librarian, like if I don't know the answers, I figure out who does. Um, and so, you know, even, you know, even if it doesn't have anything to do with the Chicano, um, Latino population, because I also work in the, the center as part of the Institute of American Culture, where we work with indigenous communities, black communities and ancient communities as, as well. So, so kind of working with each other and, and like you said, finding the best home for it where they can take care of it. And, you know, something that again, kind of going with community agency, a kind of a further step that I take is, is also making sure that you, your expectations are met, that things are very clear in, in donating materials and knowing how they're gonna be used and what your rights are and being comfortable with that. Cause that's gonna be a lifelong relationship. I talk to probably a donor every day about something, um, whether it's about uh, the actual collection, stuff that they wanna donate or programming um, and so forth. And so really just, yeah, figure out kind of what you have and where, where you would see it at um, and, and reaching out to people like us who, who do that kind of work um, you know, even if it's just for advice to help you kind of point you in the right direction. Um, exactly. But, but definitely. Because even like if we don't acquire it, we feel professionally responsible to tell people, well, maybe the best place for this is over here. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. I mean, like, don't, don't tell my boss this, but, um, <laughs> but, you know, I'll, I'll definitely let them know, like, oh, you know, I would love to have it. The reason why I'm having this conversation with you is because I believe in preserving it. I see the value in it. Um, but, you know, this is a collection from Colorado. So maybe it should be in Colorado versus maybe like UCLA. Um, but, but also too, sometimes those institutions don't have the means to take it. So also just participating with them and be like, well, we would love to, you know, have it, but then collaborate with you because we know that you have the community there that this represents. So. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, I did just want to also add, if it's okay, um, the, uh, we could certainly offer assistance to um, Susan if you need anything, but the state archives also does have a local government records program. So if you are from a local entity, if you're a city or a county or an affiliated group, um, we can offer support or assistance in terms of records management and archiving or uh, just general preservation training. So if that's something that would be helpful, you can always let us know too, and we're happy to assist. Sounds very good. So we have a lot of volunteers here. Um, 
so I think we're 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 at time to wrap up, aren't we? I think so. And thanks so much, everyone who wrote into the chat. I'll download your comments and share them with the attendees. And don't hesitate to reach out. I've put my email address into the chat, and I'm happy to direct any inquiries to Susan or our fellow panelists. Well, I want to thank the panelists. I want to thank the, the, the people that joined us as audience and participants, first of all. Thank you. I definitely want to thank the, the very generous and knowledgeable group that we had. I just was riveted by your presentations and the artifacts that you chose. And then for me, I want to also thank Julie Fry and Kirsten Vega and the group, the crew at California Humanities for coming up with this as part of the series uh, that they're doing on the ballot in elections in California. Thank you so much for allowing us to be involved. Thank you. Thanks so much, everyone. This was lovely. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you all.